All right, the recording has officially started. Sweet. Um, okay, so we have a couple of presentations today. And the first one is from Josh, who's from um, the ISRG. Is it? I can't remember the relationship with Let's Encrypt and ISRG. But. ISRG is the legal entity, so that's our organization. And Let's Encrypt is the name of a service that we provide. Got it. OK, cool. Um, so he's going to be talking to us today about some of the work he's doing. And then we also have another guest, uh, Jordan, who's going to go over some of the work he's been doing on um, a, a tool looking for malicious packages in PyPy. So it should be should be a good hour. Um, so Josh, do you want to take it away? You can I can stop sharing and, and you can take over the screen. Um, I sent you a link. Do you want to share my slides? Oh, yeah, I can share. I, yeah. I can do it so I can flip through them. They're right here. So, whatever you prefer. All right, why don't you go for it and I'll just ask you when to move along. Oh, hang on, that's not gonna work. I'll just do it in this mode. Cool, okay. All right, Can you hi everyone. I'm Josh from Internet Security Research Group. We are probably best known for running Let's Encrypt, but we do some other things as well. And we have a memory safety initiative that we have started on over the past year. It's not a full-blown project for us yet, but we are getting there, um, learning a lot. So I'm glad to get a chance to speak with you about it today. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I think a lot of people in this call are probably gonna be very familiar with the problem. Um, Memory safety is a big problem for the internet uh, software infrastructure. Mainly when I say that uh, a lack of memory safety is a problem, I'm talking about C and C++ code, which um, <laughs> you know, is the cause of new vulnerabilities every day. Um, it is sort of a plague on the safety of the internet. So let's go to the next slide. And when I talk about this internet software infrastructure and that being unsafe, uh, we're talking about this from top to bottom. So web browsers, you know, they're at the very top of the stack. <clears throat> That's how a lot of people experience internet. It is millions and millions of lines of C and C++ code. We know that code is not safe. We know we cannot make it safe. The vulnerabilities are nonstop. Um, and you go down from there until you get all the way down to the kernel. Um, you know, the Linux kernel is the most common topic for us, but it's a problem for pretty much all kernels. Um, sometimes even the Windows kernel has security issues. Um, so there's a lot of unsafe code out there, and we depend on that to run the internet, and uh, we would like to fix that. Let's go to the next slide. So... This is talking a little bit about the ubiquity of these vulnerabilities. Um, memory safety is not the only issue that can cause vulnerabilities, but Microsoft estimates about 70% of the vulnerabilities in their products came from a lack of memory safety. Google is saying about 90% for Android vulnerabilities. And you know, a general look at zero days um, found being exploited in the wild, but 80% were memory safety vulnerabilities. So. I don't think we need much more evidence that this is a huge problem. Um, let's go to the next slide. You get privacy violations, you get huge financial losses, denial of public services, human rights impact. Um, and while I think that we all know about these things, I'm not sure that we quite grok yet how big the consequences of our choice of programming languages is. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And we know how to solve this. It's, it's not an unsolved problem because we don't know what to do. We know what to do here. We don't know, we know not only how to make it better, but we can just fix this. We know how to get rid of it, make the whole thing go away. And the answer is that you replace code that isn't memory safe with code that is memory safe. It is a lot of work. Um, when I talked to people about this starting a couple of years ago, you know, a really common reaction was, 
this sounds like a lot of work that seems almost unreasonable. We're not going to go rewrite all the code that the world depends on. Um, you know, C and C++ are here to stay. They're not going anywhere. Um, I don't think that's true at all. Um, yeah, it is a lot of work, but we have a lot of smart people in this world and a lot of resources. And if we decide we want to solve this problem, we can solve it. So it is a lot of work, but it's not that much work. It's doable. And I think with the right partners, we can fix this for a lot of the internet software infrastructure over the next five to 10 years. So let's go to the next slide. So we have this memory safety initiative at ISRG, and we have two goals. Move the internet software infrastructure to memory safe code. And the second one is change the way that people think about memory safety. And I'm gonna go through what we plan to do about both of these goals. Let's go to the next slide. So we're a small organization. We're about 16 full-time people today. We are not gonna go out and rewrite you know, all the C and C++ code that is critical to the infrastructure ourselves. That's not going to happen. So we view our role as coming up with a strategy, facilitating and coordinating the work that needs to be done, raising the money that needs to, you know, we need to raise to do this work, and then communicating with the public about what we're doing. Our engineers might do a little bit of work here and there, but for the most part, we'll be enabling community and maintainers to do the work. Next slide. So the first part of our approach is to identify projects that have the best return on investment potential. So we consider a number of factors. So usage is a big one. The more heavily used the piece of software is, the bigger the benefit you get if you fix it. The second one is security sensitivity. You know, it makes sense to focus on pieces of software that are in a position to be exploited more so than other pieces. So it makes more sense to fix something that's on the edge of the network than it does that simply, that, than it does to fix something that is simply buried behind a number of layers of protection. Another one is, can we do this in a modular way? Can we replace particular components of a piece of software instead of a wholesale rewrite? Because wholesale rewrites are even more difficult to pull off. And the last one is, maintainer project and cooperation. So the more a maintainer is willing to participate in this effort and cooperate, the easier it is to do this. And we'll get into that a little more. Let's go to the next slide. So maintainers have really valuable knowledge, but even more importantly, they have the ability to ship memory safety updates to their existing users. So if you're worried about the safety of a particular piece of software, if you need to create an alternative to that software, then you're gonna to have to get users to switch to your alternative, which is a big, it's a big hurdle. If you can get the maintainer on board and fix the actual project, users can be protected through just a normal software update, which everyone should be running. So it's very important to have maintainers on, on board whenever you can. If you can fund those maintainers, it helps you to create buy-in and alleviates resource concerns. So we really try to talk to maintainers and see if we can get them to participate that, in this. And it's not going to work for every project. Some maintainers just aren't going to do it for whatever reason. Then we might have to come up with another strategy, but whenever possible, we want to work with them. Go to the next slide. So we really prefer a modular approach. It is difficult to go to any project, whether it's curl or the Linux kernel or a web browser, anything, and say, you know, we need to rewrite this from scratch and then re and then release, you know, the results of that effort. Rewriting from scratch, um, oh, sorry, using modules, you can find existing memory safe libraries that can be swapped in replacing libraries that are not memory safe. That is not too much work and gets back to this point where we're going to find a really good return on investment. Um, breaks it up into manual pieces, and you get incremental value delivered um, in a reasonable amount of time. So if you want to round up, rewrite something, it might be years to deliver that. You swap a critical library out for a memory safe library. You can do that maybe in a couple months and ship that out, and everyone can reap the benefits of that. Next slide. 
So the, the last part of our approach that I want to talk about here is building trust by providing additional success stories over time. So it's hard to walk into a project and say, you know, we want you to ultimately move this project away from C and let's say, for example, towards Rust. You know, maintainers may not know Rust. They don't know if Rust is the right choice. Um, could be some other language. I'm just using Rust as an example here, but they may not know the language. They don't, may not know if it's the right choice. It might just seem like too much work to do this. You know, they don't have the resources they are already stressed out. There's any number of reasons why they might not want to do it. Um, so we need to go out and listen to maintainers, hear their concerns, and come up with plans that will work in different situations. And then we need to be able to go to maintainers and show them how this has played out with other projects and say, you know, for example, Curl had maybe had the same set of concerns as you, and here's how we dealt with those concerns, and here's how everything played out, and how we're able to deliver a safer product. Um, so we're starting with some some projects where we have maintainer buy-in and have you know a good path to success, and we're going to use those stories to help other maintainers make the decision to go down that road, and we're going to build up you know, a corpus of success stories. And uh, hopefully that will convince more maintainers to help out. Next slide. So we're focusing on three things at the moment. We may do some more things shortly, but the first one is uh, curl. So we've publicly announced a project to make curls HTTP and TLS code memory safe. This project was our first project because it really embodies all the things that we've talked about here in our approach. You know, I had to talk to the maintainer for a little while, but eventually we got him on board. So we've got maintainer cooperation here. We have raised money to fund the maintainer to do a bunch of the work that helps with buy-in, it helps, helps us get a better job done. Um, we've got a modular approach going on here. So we're not rewriting curl from scratch but we're replacing OpenSSL with Russell's, and we are replacing the networking libraries with a safe networking library called um, Hyper. And this is, you know, the work is actually getting pretty close to done now. So a couple more months, we'll have something ready to go, and that can ship in a relatively short amount of time. You don't have to spend years rewriting curl. Um, so this is a perfect example of what I'd like to accomplish and the kinds of projects we want to work on first. And once we deliver these success stories, we can move on to projects that are a little more difficult. So next up, we're going to be announcing some things about Apache HTTPD. This is a bigger project, obviously. There are a lot more people involved, a lot more stakeholders. And we're going to learn how to help them move in the right direction. So I'm not quite ready to talk about the details of that yet, but we'll be making some announcements soon. And the last example is the Linux kernel. And honestly, when I started working on this, we made a list of all the projects that might you know, be something we could help with. And at the bottom of my initial list a year ago, I had the Linux kernel and basically thought, you know, I'm an optimist. I'm willing to go out and try to rewrite most of the software that underpins the internet. But uh, the Linux kernel is just too hard, you know. Um, it's just going to be hard to get buy-in. It's going to be hard to make it work. Um, there are a lot of roadblocks for that. But then I learned about some work that Alex Gaynor has been doing, um, getting Linux kernel maintainers adjusted to the idea that maybe allowing Rust modules is a good idea. And then he went out there and wrote some proof of concept modules and is now working on a patch that will enable Rust modules in the Linux kernel that can be merged into the Linux kernel. So Alex has done something that uh, I did not think was possible in this amount of time, and we are getting shockingly close to be able to invest in Linux kernel modules that are written in Rust. So hopefully within the next uh, six months, we'll be announcing some efforts to rewrite some key kernel modules in Rust. Next slide. So I feel like this is a topic I need to address, which is, you know, memory safety with C and C++ is a problem. And there are people 
building fuzzing tools and static analysis tools. Those things need to be built. And they're important because we're not going to rewrite all this code, certainly not in a short amount of time. And these things really do help. These just are not what we are working on. So that's just not this project. We're glad that those things are happening, but it's not us. Um, they do in introduce a bunch of overhead. So projects have to run them, make sure they're running. You got to keep running them. And they don't ultimately solve the problem. Problems, projects that you fuzz and apply static analysis, they still have more safety vulnerabilities. So they're important mitigations, but they do not solve the problem. And they introduce some overhead. And you know, our focus is on just trying to, to fix the problem entirely. Next slide. So I said before that our second goal was changing the way that people think about things. So if you go ask an engineer on your team, you know, can you set up a reverse proxy or something? They're probably going to pick a piece of software that is millions of lines of C and C++. And if there's anything we've learned about C and, plus, C and C++ again, it is not safe. It is full of memory vulnerabilities. They're going to come out. But, you know, it's 2020. We've learned this lesson a million times. But it's still pretty, stock, pretty standard practice to stick millions of lines of C and C++ on the edge of your network. That has to change. We can't, we can't continue doing this. Um, we're just going to get bitten over and over again. And again, real people pay the price. Um, think back to that slide. You know, it's financial losses. It's hospitals getting shut down. It's massive privacy breaches. Um, we can't keep doing this. We need to get to the point where you know, sticking Apache or Nginx or something else that's written in C on the edge of your network is seen as irresponsible. It's not safe. We already know that. Um, so we need to get to that different mindset. Um, so we're going to get there um, by investing in communications and helping people understand why our effort is important. Next slide. That is the end. Um, I believe I've come in just under the 20 minutes. So I want to thank Paul Kerr and Alex Gaynor um, for the work that they have done in helping us with this problem. And also Daniel Stenberg, who's the maintainer of Curl, who has been a great uh, initial partner in this project. Okay, cool. I think we can take a few questions. Um, Jordan, I'm not sure how much time you need. Or... No, 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 we're doing just fine. We're, we're more than welcome okay. to take questions. Yeah, uh, so I, uh, if I can jump in, uh, David Wheeler, I, I agree with you that the modular approach in general is better. One challenge with the modular approach is that now you have the challenge of, of conversions and dealing with the date with differences in data structures and approaches between different languages. Um, have you found any better ways to uh, to make it so that crossing between the modules is less painful than it has been in the past? It really depends on your language choice. Um, you know, I don't think that the answer to every memory safety problem is Rust, but Rust has really made it possible to solve this problem in a way that, like, I don't think this project will, really would have made sense prior to having Rust mature. And one of the most important things about Rust is that it works really well with C and C++ code. So the foreign function interface is fantastic. It has no runtime. There's no conflicting garbage collector and none of that stuff. So it's possible to make really sensible, fast interfaces between Rust and C and C++. So, you know, in the module approach, one of the nice things is that a lot of projects can benefit from the same module. So for example, we're, we're investing pretty heavily in the Russell's TLS library to replace OpenSSL. So we are building a C API that's going to be in the Russell's repository that any C program can use. It will be very fast. It's much more intuitive than the OpenSSL API. We invest in this API once, and we can do it in curl. We can do it in Apache. We can do it all over. Um, this stuff really pays off in that way. And thanks to Rust, we don't have to worry about the the trade-offs we used to have to worry about with conflicting runtimes or the speed of conversions between one language and another. I hope that answers your question. Cool. 
So I, I'm curious, uh, I, I know it's a modular approach and it's something we've talked about in this working group before too, is every project's different, you know, everything needs a different thing. Um, do you do you have ideas how you might like scale your work? Like, is it is it funding? Is it is it people like doing these negotiations with maintainers? Or have you have you have you thought about that? Yeah, I think we need to find ways to focus on the most important things. The most important things for us right now are to build up some success stories so that we can refute you know, concerns that people have about this stuff. So for example, we need to get curl done. When curl is done and it's working well, you know, that gets us the ability to talk to more people. Um, we need to focus on high value projects. So if you want to reach a lot of people and scale, I mean, it depends on what you mean by scale, but if the goal here is to deliver memory safe software updates to a lot of people, then you just got to pick the right projects. So, you know, um, focusing on something like Russell's and saying, you know, Russell's is our choice for a memory safe TLS library. We can do all the work here and we don't have to convert eight different, you know, open SSL libraries to memory safe code. Um, that's not going to happen. So beyond that, if we're talking about scale in terms of how many people can we get working on this in parallel, part of the answer is just having the funding to do the projects that we need. Mm -hmm. But I think we also just need to be a little patient. If you rush out there and try to, you know, fund everything and get a thousand engineers working on this tomorrow, it's going to be a bit of a mess, right? We need to be careful and build up our case. Um, so we want to get the funding that we want for, you know, the next set of projects that make sense. We want to have that available, but I don't think we want to scale too fast. Um, we want to be strategic about it. Yeah, it makes sense. I'd be curious um, how we how you're defining what projects are important. I know you said based on usage, if there's, you know, if we could collaborate on some of that together, what you're using for heuristics to come up with your list could be interesting. Yeah, the way I try to think about it is, instead of thinking about, you know, Apache, Nginx, and Linux kernel as being three different things, for example, count each instance of those things in the world, right? Like. Pretty much every web stack these days, not all of them, but most of them use the Linux kernel, right? So let's say you've got, you know, several billion instances of the Linux kernel, that's its weight, you know? Then there's a certain amount of weight to Nginx based on how heavily that's used, how many instances of Nginx are out there in the world. Um, so you wanna look at how common something is. Obviously we're only looking at things that are written in C and C++. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know that in a lot of the vulnerability analysis that your working groups do, you're talking about a lot of JavaScript projects and dependencies and things like that. And certainly there are security concerns there, but you know, luckily memory safety is not one of them. So we're really only looking at commonly used C and C++ applications. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to be lower level, mm -hmm. except, except for web browsers. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And how easy it will be to use this new memory safe project in other languages? The question is, how easy will it be to use which project? This new project like new core and can oh. it, for example, be used in Python for web communication? I'm sorry, I'm still not quite sure I understand the question, but I can say that, you know, curl is going to work exactly the way it did before. There's no change to the behavior of curl once we change the networking and uh, TLS libraries. So if it works today, it'll keep working. But, but can you use it as a library in other language? Can you use curl as a library? Yes, there is a lib curl. Yeah. library that's part of the curl project and libcurl will use the memory safe networking in tls hey uh question you mentioned something about funding josh this is dave stewart from intel have you uh where do you where does your funding come today initially so we've been self-funding some of it and the first external funding that we've received is from google Okay, 
I'm, 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 uh, I was trying to look it up and get my question answered and I'm, I'm failing <laughs> so far. So anyway, yeah, we haven't actually published it yet. This was pretty recent. So Google is, uh, funding the work with curl and some of the work of Apache. Okay. But ISIG is a uh, nonprofit basically. So you look for contributions for these things. Right. We're a nonprofit. Um, our, you know, we are not, we don't have the funds to fund all the work that we would like to do ourselves. So our, our role here is to figure out the projects and figure out the best return on investment, where's the best place to put in resources, and then we'll go raise that money and make sure that it gets to the right people to get the work done. Okay, cool. So pretty soon we're going to come talk to you about some Linux kernel modules that are very widely used for Intel hardware. Yeah, I, I, yeah no, I'm, I, I love it. Come, come talk to us. Um, uh, I, I'm, I, this is, this is sort of a, a continually depressing, uh, topic because we were just launched some fuzzing, uh, efforts and found some code that it's like, yeah, memory safety. Ugh. And I was looking with the, over the shoulder of the researcher and staring at the code and I'm going, wait, they're not checking any of the input parameters here and they're using it to index into arrays. And it's like, wait, they're like. And then he see the researcher said, "Yeah, this is crap code." So it's like awesome, and it's code that it was written by an Intel person. It's maintained by an Intel person today, um, not like it's part of their um, sort of day job, right? And and it's uh, what's distressing if we hadn't launched this fuzzer effort uh, for a separate you know project, it'd be like, well, we would never have found this. Or or and I think these bugs have been around at least until since 2016 and maybe since 2011. So yeah. that doesn't make me, that makes me incredibly depressed because if we hadn't done this fuzzing, we would never have found it well, until, well, maybe it's being exploited every day, who knows, by uh, yeah. you know, some criminals or something like that. So um, yeah, it's, it's a, and it started getting us really interested in, gee, I wonder what other parts of the code, you know, not necessarily stuff that we've done, but other parts of the code that might be similarly crappy. So um, it's a, it's yeah. a, uh, and and nobody would have, um, in their day job, said, "Oh, you should rewrite this Intel in Rust." Right? It's like it's yeah. good we never would have touched unless there was a bug. So, well, that's an important point about fuzzers, which is that you know part of their value is in helping you make C and C plus plus code a little safer. Um, but part of their value is in pointing out to you how bad this code actually is. You know. And it's not about Intel engineers or Google engineers. All human engineers writing C and, plus, C and C++ code, they're not good enough at it. It's not a particular engineer. Humans do not write good enough code to keep it memory safe. The answer here is to have the compiler do it for you, and that's what you know, Rust and Java and JavaScript memory safe languages. Put that burden on the compiler, and compilers are, you know, they should be doing the job, not people. People will fail every time even with fuzzers and static analysis. Well, we could have a long conversation about this, but I, I probably better not, uh, you know, I, I, I have a lot of intellectual curiosity relative to this, uh, uh, and the Rust conversation is one that is, uh, it's not a new one uh, in my mind. But anyway, that's that's great. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. The, the fuzzing conversation you just brought up made me think of maybe another way to help pitch this to companies to chip in. Um, you know, Google is spending an enormous amount of money running fuzzers every year. I'm sure a lot of other companies are too. Um, that's going to continue basically forever. Um, maybe if we can come up with a way to repurpose some of that budget to these longer term rewrites and memory safe languages, um, that's actually a pretty good investment over time and we could turn down the amount of money we're spending on fuzzing. Yeah. I get I get pretty concerned about the how much complexity is layered onto modern software development. You know, you, you got to do CI, you got fuzzing, static analysis, all these other things you need to do in order to responsibly develop software. And when you make the process that complex, you're going to increase the chance of failures. You're going to increase the chance that people don't take the steps that they should be taking. Um, this is a place where you know the compiler can do the work, and you're not adding a step. And we don't have to add this layer of fuzzing and static analysis for memory safety on top of it. So I think another benefit of all of this is removing complexity from the general best practices for software development. 
Yeah, Josh, if I, I could push back a little bit, um, you can have memory safety and you still need fuzzers and you still need static analyzers. You just don't need them to detect for memory safety properties. There's other properties sure. that you want yeah. have memory safety. Uh, I, but, uh, and that, that, but, you know, that statement I just said uh, doesn't mean that this uh, switching to memory safe is a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> totally. But if you if you forget to run a fuzzer or you're too lazy or something, if your code is memory safe, the consequences of your you know, the consequences of not running a fuzzer are, are much less, right? Depends on what it's doing, but uh sure. but it, it, it's it's still better. How's this? Yeah. I, I think you but my my point still stands. You still need fuzzers, you still need static analysis. But this, but uh, you're also right that those two are not guaranteeing the things that using a memory safe language does. Agreed. Cool. Thank you, Josh. This was this was really helpful. Thank you. Looking forward to talking more. Thank you so much. Yeah, and then the link to the slides are in the um, meeting notes if anyone wants to go back and, and reference them. Um, Jordan, I don't know if you have slides or you just want to talk. Either is totally fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do you want me no, to share that? But no, that's uh, that's just a link to the blog post. Uh, so what I was hoping to do was just kind of briefly uh, give an overview of the research that I did, um, and then talk about why I think that uh, the Open SSF is an awesome organization to kind of take it to the next step. Um, talk about what that looks like, what that means. Uh, and then try to kind of figure out what those next steps look like. Um, and we can kind of go from there. Uh, so hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jordan. I am here just representing myself today uh, because uh, I recently uh, moved from working at Duo Security, uh, you know, part of Cisco, uh, and have joined Stripe uh, as a security engineer on their team. Um, so I did this research like in the middle of that week-long gap. Uh, so, uh, so I still haven't figured out the uh, you know, the process of, of coming on board uh, under Stripe's umbrella, but I'm working on that uh, and, and already talking to people about this effort. Um, so more to come there. So today I'm just here as Jordan. Uh, so uh, the research that I did, I wanted to see if I could use dynamic analysis to try and find potentially malicious packages um, on PyPy. Uh, you know, we've all kind of heard the Incidents in the past, not just on PyPy, but on any package manager. You know, a um, there may be like a, a typo squatting package, or um, you know, reuse credentials give a, an actor access to a popular package. They try to put malicious uh, content in it, um, and that could have pretty significant effects. You know, I always try to err away from you know spreading fud and and in and, and hyping things up, but it could be significant. You know, if if I ever feel you know calm, then I'll just go to libraries.io slash experiments and see some of the metrics that they post up in terms of just how often these are downloaded with like one maintainer, haven't been touched in, in years, uh, and, and my anxiety goes right back up. Um, my hope was to um, try to figure out, you know, can we use dynamic analysis to find malicious activity with a high signal to noise ratio? Now, what does it look like? Um, because some package managers, PyPy included, already have some, uh, you know, malware checking um, um, capabilities. You know, for example, there was just some some effort done on PyPy to do more of the static analysis work. Um, which is great. You know, that, that takes a huge chunk out of the equation. And the goal here is just kind of a uh, raising the bar exercise uh, to make it harder for uh, attackers to put malicious content on, on package managers. But in my case, what I did uh, was I set up a pipeline that installed every package on PyPy while it was running a tool called Sysdig, looking at what syscalls happened whenever packages were installed. The benefit of this is that since we're watching syscalls that happen between pip in this case and the kernel, we can see things like file accesses, commands being executed, network connections being established um, that removes any kind of potential obfuscation that came with the code. Uh, that's one of the things that makes static analysis a little bit harder, um, you know, to kind of offset some of the more expensive nature of this dynamic analysis, actually installing the package. 
Uh, and it was pretty successful. You know, I show a few case studies in, in my blog post um, that show just how powerful this is, being able to take an obfuscated block of code and show exactly what commands were executed, exactly what network connections were established. Um, and I think this is really promising um, for a few reasons. You know, the first is that it gives that high signal. You know, yes, there are a lot of syscalls that happen whenever you install a package. You know, that that's expected, right? But there are some things that would make us at least kind of raise our eyebrows, so to speak, um, that would warrant further investigation. You know, if there's network connections really in general, I think it's worth looking into, you know, why is this package reaching out somewhere just whenever I'm installing it? Um, likely it's the case that it's benign. It may just be installing some helping components. It may be, uh, you know, installing some other setup scripts, but uh, that's always something to kind of look at with suspicion. Or if they're accessing different places on the file system, that would make me concerned. You know, for example, if something's trying to read SSH keys, or if they're trying to um, access, you know, secrets on disk, you know, in common places, those are suspicious. Uh, and we can kind of get a feel for things that we would want to at least investigate um, as early as possible before these packages would be downloaded, um, you know, many times. Um, and so the research went well, you know, I think it looks really promising. And so what I'm excited about the OpenSSF is that whenever we think about the next steps, you know, that was a one-time study and I talk in the, the blog post, the benefit is doing this continuously, watching new packages as they update, doing this same type of analysis that way we can catch things as early as possible. The benefit of doing this with the OpenSSF is that it's a central organization uh, that, that brings everybody together in a room and um, we can make this one capability accessible to any number of upstream package managers. Um, compare this with other options, right? One option is that we ask each package manager to run this infrastructure themselves. That's difficult, both because we're repeating work and because I have nothing but empathy and respect for all the people maintaining our package managers. Uh, you know, many of them are volunteers uh, on limited funding, limited budget, limited people. And I would rather this be done in a place where it's a centralized capability that everyone gets the benefits from. And the other alternative is that I've had companies reach out to me saying, hey, I'd like to use your thing just at my company as part of my CI pipeline. I said, I don't think you should. Like, I, don't, I see this as something that we could solve centrally for the ecosystem, not something that every company should be doing because it's not really a special thing. You know, it's something that we're all accessing the same open source packages, we might as well solve this and solve it once. Uh, and so that's why the open SSF makes perfect sense because we're getting everybody together. We can have really, really close ties with maintainers of upstream package managers. Um, and we can set up some kind of um, just communication, you know, honestly, you know, where we figure out what do we do whenever we see something suspicious, um, kind of who's you know, how do we triage that until we have a, a confidence level uh, to bring it to the maintainers upstream? Uh, the goal being that we're not overwhelming people with false positives, you know, that we're not um, asking them just like investigate all these yourselves with the already limited time that you have. Um, so where we are now is that the research is done. I am starting to put together a roadmap of what things need to happen before this is kind of considered robust. For example, I just started with PyPy. Um, you know, NPM, RubyGems, you name it, are all great candidates. Uh, and they've, they've, I'm not the only one who's done dynamic analysis uh, in the past. You know, I think there's even multiple people on the call who have done work uh, in this space uh, really similar to what I've done. Um, so I'm excited that we can all kind of put our heads together um, and figure out what this looks like. Uh, so, yeah, making this a continuous scanning for multiple package managers, um, trying to increase the signal to noise ratio. You know, right now my process was very scientific. I got a whole bunch of data and then I just grepped a lot. Like that was, that was pretty much it because I didn't even know what it was that I was looking for. I was like, let me think about what would be suspicious and see what I can find. It was very, um, you know, it was a whole, a whole science oriented thing. Um, so we would prefer for 
people to not have to do that as much as having that be done for us, like in an automated fashion, uh, and then use the expensive people cycles where they could be used most uh, and be the most beneficial. Uh, so all this together, that's that's why I'm here, uh, is just to kind of chat with you all, figure out one, is this even the right subgroup to be in? Uh, because there, there are multiple subgroups under the OpenSSS. Um, for two, to hear from you all about y'all's perspectives, what you think can go well, what you are worried about, uh, and then just try to figure out what next steps look like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very cool. Very and and it's great standing up something in a week uh, between jobs. I love that story. It was awesome. Well done. Uh, sorry. No, oh, <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jordan. This is this is really interesting. Uh, I, I love the idea of being able to take this and scale it out to other package managers and everything. Um, I'm not sure where we go directly from here. I know Dan and I on the Google side are looking at some ways that we might be able to support this and support this work. Um, so that's that's where we are. Yeah, I, yeah sorry. I was I, I had a family member come <laughs> mention something to me. I was I, I, I apologize. This is living at work now. Um, what uh, um, I was going to say uh, was that, yeah, I, I love what your thought process here as well as, you know, one of the things we stood up a few years ago was a, a capability, which at least on the kernel side would try and build the latest tip and try and boot it on a huge number of machines, right? This was like the boot problem. We call it our zero day lab. And so we, we did this every night and, you know, based on if we saw boot failures, we'd send mail back to the, the kernel mailing list and you know, said, hey, this patch, you know, we'd, we'd bisect it and this is the patch that was, was causing problems. So I think even, even without the research, I think what you basically said is, this is not terribly scientific, but it's something at least gives people an indicator of where to look and be suspicious, right? If somebody wants to really, you know, uh, nail into this, but even more so if something, if a new package or a revised package goes into, you know, PyPy, you'd, you'd want to say, oh, look, uh, maybe a piece of email that would poke up a, uh, a diff, right? You know, and that's, that's, you know, that's the sort of thing that an organization like, uh, um, um, you know, Google, Intel, Microsoft, somebody, you know, or even like the PSF, that's, that's another interesting possibility because PSF is in theory, um, um, you know, their, their goal is to try and improve overall Python, right. Uh, capabilities like this. And so PSF, um, I think, I think, in, uh, collaborating with those guys as well, at least on the Python side now, you know, node, uh, PHP, et cetera, Ruby, as you said, there's a lot of other package managers that, that, you know, but this has this has real promise too. Yeah, there's there's another thing to mention, which is there's a question of whenever we see weird things happen, what do we do? And and there's a couple of answers. One is that if there's something that's weird in terms of actively harmful, you know, in that case, there's an opportunity to let the package manager maintainers know so that the package can be removed, right? And these, but there's another option too. You know, I know that we recent we being um, all of y'all um, doing doing all the work. The OpenSSF has released the scorecard uh, capability, um, and the goal is to try to give people answers to the question: What's the risk of like bringing this package into my organization? Right? You know, like what, what you know, what are some heuristics that I can kind of get a gut check on? On do I need to care about this? This kind of information might be useful. Hey, just letting you know, it runs these commands, it makes these network calls, um, you know, anytime that it's installed. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that you may want to think about it. And I think that's that's useful. So it's it's not, the only output doesn't have to be just going to package manager maintainers. It could also be giving people downstream more information about the things that they're installing and the things that they're using. And um, one super quick note, you mentioned PSF. I did want to give a shout out because we have Dustin on the call and Dustin reached out uh, shortly after uh, the research was published. So I know that, you know, I don't want to speak for you, Dustin, but I think there's interest, you know, in, in just kind of what this might look like, right? Absolutely. PSF has a ton of interest. PyPI has a ton of interest. This has been sort of ongoing issue with, like you said, this package manager and every other one as well. So, uh, yeah, and I wanted to chime in like, not only is having some form of analysis of every project on PyPI uh, interesting, but also 
if we had a way to sort of classify the behaviors at install time of a project, like this package makes network requests. The users could potentially in the future have the ability to say, just don't install anything that makes network requests. If we have that metadata about everything on PyPI, it gives the users a lot more control over their ability to install and uh, use the, the projects there. Um, I don't know. Yeah, sorry, I called it PyPy, because it, but it, but PyPy is something different. PyPI, yeah, uh, I know PyPy really well, yeah. As you guys scale this out, um, we just did uh, a syscall monitoring project for one of our commercial products at Small Step that plugs in directly to eBPF and then has like a collection stack that dumps the events into an elastic cluster. It's like I said, it's part of our commercial cluster, but or commercial product, but um, if we could help you guys scale this out in any way, I mean, minimally, we'd be happy to share experience, if not code. That'd be great. Yeah, I'll say that the, the hard part about this is the, the piece in the pipeline that installs the package and watches syscalls. You know, ideally, right now it's just a C2 instance, you know, and, and, and I, I throw sysdig on it and then I spin up you know, a couple of containers, one to watch network, network traffic and then one to actually install the package. And Sysdig is running on the host with some filters set up to only catch those those syscalls, right? I'd love to make that scalable where yeah. instead of running it on an EC2 host, everything's just thrown up in its own container um, and, and we go from there. So I'd, I'd love to chat with you more about that. And um, Yeah, I'd be happy to share what I know. So great. That sounds perfect. And uh, the, the, oh, yeah, one thing I wanted to mention was the reason, one other reason I'm excited to be here at the OpenSSF is that I know the question was given to, uh, I think it was, was Josh about like where funding comes from. That's hugely exciting to me because right now my funding is my wallet. And so that would be great to <laughs> not have that be the case. Uh, because I think about that when I'm considering doing this on an ongoing basis. We're working on that on the Google side. We're happy to invite friends and family members to join us for those on the call. <laughs> wait, wait, Are we selling t-shirts, buttons? Yeah. What's that? And, and, and plushies. Don't forget the plushies. Oh, I sent Jordan one. <laughs> <laughs> and a shirt. <laughs> So um, let, let me, uh, I, I'm going to jump in real, real quick. I, I can't speak for this entire working group, of course, but uh, in my personal head, at least, uh, I think that the major repo, the major repositories, PyPI, Node.js, are critical projects in their own right. I mean, you know, if, if I wrote down a definition of what's critical uh, and PyPI didn't show up there, you know, or didn't at least meet that criteria, that would be kind of surprising to me. So, so I, I mean, you know, you could certainly feel free to talk to other open SSF working groups, but certainly I think this working group would be a perfectly reasonable place to discuss this. Um, I, I guess there's, there's several issues as far as your implementation, you know, the, the whole analysis. Uh, the one thing that concerns me is, you know, a, you know, there's several different kinds of malicious actors here involved. Um, uh, you know, some are just going to try to slip in and they're attacking, you know, the, the person who wrote the code is actually getting attacked themselves, you know, their passwords or you know, got stolen or whatever. Um, but then you have the ones who are actually in, uh, intentional delusional malicious code, or they're really uh, willing to put in effort. And so they may try to evade any detection mechanism you put. Um, so it seems to me that you want like the general mechanism of gathering the data open source, the tools to implement rules to be open source, and maybe the specific rules be the hidden secret sauce that you hide off a little bit somehow uh, so that you don't reveal what you're looking for. Because if you reveal what you're looking for, some adversaries will try to get around. Now, I, you know, maybe... You know, the, the disadvantage, of course, is that then you have a lot less cooperative help on developing those rules. So may, maybe you can make some rules, uh, you know, fully released and some not so much. But, you know, I'm just kind of thinking out the pros and the cons. But I, I do very much like the idea of analyzing stuff so that uh, in a common way so that you aren't just easily uh, a malicious actor can't just upload random garbage that's dangerous. Yeah. So, so a couple. I, I agree with you, and and a couple things that 
in the past, whenever I've thought about you know evasion that, that I kind of lean on, the first is the first is that my goal is is not necessarily to eliminate you know the the, the problem entirely. You know, it's very much just to raise the bar and it, to make it more costly, more difficult uh, to introduce malicious code into any of these package managers and at a low cost to us, right? You know, if I'm spending a dollar and they have to now spend ten, twenty dollars, that's that's a pretty good trade off. Yeah. Um, the the other thing is that if we think about the level that we're monitoring at. Um, we think about the rules, but the rules to me is really just what do we filter down to to look at kind of manually? Um, because if we look at the syscall level, as soon as you make a network connection, I'm going to know. Or as soon as you, uh, you know, invoke a shell, uh, you know, and, and call exec ve, we're we're going to know, right? And even if that's probing the system uh, to look for if certain files exist, if it's kind of profiling the system, we have the capability to kind of know that too, right? And so that's. That's a benefit. So, but there is the, what do we elevate for people to look at? Uh, right. You know, we we can be careful with with that. But I think there's a lot of promise to to this in terms of raising the raising the bar and at least giving us the positioning to know whenever certain things happen. And and maybe maybe one option here is kind of split this up. I mean, if if you do an analysis and here's what we see. You know, here's you know here you know you download this uh, 50 gigabyte file of, of every syscall and you know the, the in in JSON form and so on. Uh, you could then stick a whole bunch of different tools to look at it. Um, and yeah, different, different, that's different, we can't know. give this data away. You know what I mean? Like yeah. whenever we, that's that's one of the things that I considered doing uh, until. Uh, I opened up my wallet and I was like, there's not much here. Uh, so I can't go and just like give that everyone access to like a terabyte of data on S3 and, uh, and, and get away with it. Uh, but there's, there's tons of opportunities there to, to team up with folks who want to go digging for stuff that we've missed. So that kind of ties into I guess, the next step. And you, you mentioned this a little bit before, but once you found a malicious packet or a package we think is malicious, what do you do with that information? I know that this kind of fits into the category, I guess, of typo squatting packages in my head. Um, and I know from a presentation in one of the other working groups, uh, like the Ruby gems, um, people have had actually a whole bunch of trouble getting typo squatted packages filed as CVEs. You know, the CVE authorities don't actually consider those to be a CVE. The package does what it's meant to do. It's just meant to be malicious. And so that itself is not technically a CVE because it's not a vulnerability in that package. It's by design. Um, and so there, it almost points to a need for a separate place to put these flagged malicious things that are malicious by design. I'll chime in. The, the, on the long tail of all the projects on these package indices, basically anything we can identify as potentially malicious is going to be a valid use case for a given project. So I think anything that you know blocks them up front, prevents them from being installed, anything like that is just probably not going to work. But raising awareness to end users so that they can sort of see the behaviors of a package that they're considering or evaluating. I think that's really going to be the crucial thing. And then, you know, the indices can then build something and it's like, uh, you know, flag this, warn other users about this in some way. Um, yeah, that's my thought. I mean, there's probably some that are clearly malicious, though, that you might consider taking down on the PyPI side, right? Like some of the typo squatting ones, I think, have been taken down in the past. Like if a package just uploads all the keys in your home directory or something like that when it's installed and it's clearly camouflaging as something else. <laughs> If we would identify those very specific behaviors, then yeah, right. probably. Yeah, there is definitely a long set of blurry stuff in the middle, though. Yeah, I mean, you you could make you know have different categories like suspicious, and you know, and hopefully, eventually, you know, we won't install install suspicious packages unless you ash, you know, dash dash, you know, install dangerous suspicious things or whatever. <laughs> And then at least, and then at least, there's a, uh, a protection for Joe Average who, or Joanne Average who just, you know, they're they're expecting something simple, and uh, they type dash instead of underscore and didn't get what they were expecting. Yeah, there's there's so much room for us figuring out how opinionated we on the OpenSSF even want to be um, in, in terms of you know what. What do we want to give upstream, or do we just want to try to give high signal upstream and then let package manager maintainers do what they they feel is best, kind of for their ecosystem, right? And there's a lot of a lot of room in the middle. Uh, but I do want to do a time check. I know that we're like at time. I apologize for taking over 20 minutes. Um, 
you know, I'm happy to kind of stop the discussion there. We can just kind of work together, um, figuring out next steps offline. I, I think this is fine. I, the, this discussion is, is really interesting, so don't worry about the time. I think we can move stuff to next time. Um, yeah. yeah that's I, very timely. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I think we can do one more question if someone else has one more question they want to ask. Not a question, but an observation. I, I agree with Dan that there's a whole lot in the middle. I think that was you, Dan, that said that. But maybe what we really need to do is start by, um, you know, trying to do these sorts of things because I think that PyPI would be more confident about, say, removing or not allowing install by default if they were very, very confident in the signal. And if they're not very confident in the signal, then I think it's quite appropriate to say, well, you know, maybe I'll let them find that information, but I don't want to, you know, hold folks back. So I, I think what we really need to do is drill in on the trying to make at least the information available. And then as a separate step, uh, work on trying to, you know, uh, be more proactive. I have a question. Like, uh, did you notice that malicious behavior only during install time, or did you try running some things too, like, sure. uh, like importing or calling the API or something? Great question. So, um, in my research, I strictly installed the package. That to me was kind of the trust boundary. You know, the assumption was you could make an argument that if I'm able to download it, then I can at least see what it is that I would be installing before I, I start using it. Um, so there's there's a, a chance there, right? So um, that was my trust boundary, but I know that there have been papers in the past that I even reference in, in the post and they, they go to the trouble of importing the libraries just to see if there's like an init function that runs. Um, um, and so, so there's opportunities to expand that way as well. Yeah. And uh, did you uh, run into any scalability issues with your pipeline? Like were you able to analyze all the packages or? And how much time did it take like, for the analysis? Yeah, the biggest scalability issue was my credit card. And the, <laughs> the, the it does not scale well. Uh, not the, but, but honestly, you know, since it's not running in workloads, it's running on EC2 hosts, that was something that I had to consider. For example, on the tail end of the analysis, there were some weird issues where some packages during install happened to hang up or take longer than expected. And then that had some downstream effects. I got to have some orphaned uh, sysdig processes that I would have to go and clean up. Um, overall, you know, statistics wise, this took uh, about three to four days of running, you know, the hosts running, uh, churning through packages. I had about 12 to 15, like micro to medium EC2 hosts running. Uh, and then it cost me about 120 bucks all in, I think. Um, so, so scalability wise, I think there's always the opportunity to scale that middle section, the actual analysis, but that was running on all the packages. If we think about what a continuous pipeline looks like, those needs become smaller. That's great. Cool. cool. All right. We're out of time. Uh, thank you. All the presenters, Josh, Jordan, hope to see you guys in here again and looking forward to working more on this stuff together. Awesome. Thank y'all for having us. It was awesome to chat. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye everybody. Bye all. Bye. Thank you.